Let's take our Bibles and open to Galatians 2.20. That's our first stop on the way to Colossians 3, where we were this morning. As you turn there, I want you to think about the context always of the Scripture. To understand the Bible, you have to understand primarily what God was saying to the people he was writing it to. That really clears up a lot of problems with the Scripture. The first line of interpretation is, the, the primary interpretation is, what did God mean as he wrote to those to whom he was writing? It really affects deeply what uh, the, the depth of our understanding of the Scripture. And this epistle... Uh, the Galatians, as well as Ephesians, as well as Colossians, were written to a group of people in an area of Rome called Roman Asia. It doesn't mean anything to us, but if I said modern-day Turkey, you would get the idea. So these were three areas, two cities and one region, within what is modern Turkey. So that's interesting. But what does that mean as far as the message, especially as we get to chapter 2, verse 20? Well, Roman... Asia, uh, or modern-day Turkey, was the most Roman of the Roman Empire. In fact, even today, when you take uh, tours over there, there are more Roman ruins in Turkey than there are in all of Italy combined. There are more Greek temples in, in Turkey than there are in Greece. It was the, the epicenter of the ancient Roman Empire. It was the most civilized, you might say, other than Rome itself, which was a kind of a, a, an island there in Italy. The most Roman, outside of Rome, its, Rome itself, was all of Turkey. That was the most developed part of the empire. Again, it doesn't matter. So you're saying, why the history lesson? Well, as we get to Galatians 2 this evening, I want to describe daily life in the Roman world why they needed Galatians 2.20. In Roman Asia, or Turkey, is also a city that we know from the book of Revelation called Thyatira. That's a city from Revelation 2 that they excavated uh, kind of completely the whole city and have examined the culture of it. And it gives us probably the clearest insight into what was going on in the time of Paul's writing from the same region. What, What was life like uh, kind of like if you want to know what America was like 2,000 years uh, in the future, looking back 2,000 years, if there's even life on this earth. Uh, they would love to know what society was like in our time. And that would be captured by some of the local writing. The local writing about Roman Asia is like this, and I'd like to read it to you. This was a, the manufacturing hub of the ancient Roman world, this province of Asia. Most workers were members of... Guilds, they called them. Guilds, like a a labor union, which we would have today. They would set the price for their labor. They would give their sales areas like we give uh, territories to salespeople. And the people of the ancient Roman world were potters and dyers and tanners and bakers and metal workers and textile makers, bronze smiths, everything you need for culture and for all that is purchased by culture. And each of them had to be a part in the Roman world of one of these trade unions. So if you were a professional anything, uh, metal worker or or leather worker like the Apostle Paul was, and other areas, and lived in one area, you could not... Now remember, Paul was an itinerant one, but if you lived in a city, you had to join the cooperative, guild, or trade union. This is what went on from from the excavations of this uh, city in Roman Asia, this is what they found. Trade guilds were compulsory. In order to continue in your trade in one city, you had to be a member of the guild. In other words, it was what we would call today closed shop. You have to be in the union to work there. And so that was the first element. The second one, every guild of Roman Asia had a patron god or goddess of the Roman pantheon. Remember, they had the Roman versions of the Greek gods. And so they each had kind of like the the god of metalwork or the god of whatever, um, of tanning leather or whatever. And they would start work with paying daily homage to that deity. In other words, your shop had to kind of have, you know, like we would have uh, in some places, um, I know at the auto plants, uh, they have this, this morning regimen where they do jumping jacks, you know, the Japanese ones in Tennessee. Or, or maybe they roll the flag up and people sing, you know, uh, the, the national anthem as is, is some opening event at a place. 
in these guilds, you would offer an offering to the patron god. So that would be immediately offensive to any believer. But it was obligatory at the opening of all meetings of the artisan and craftsman in their work that you attend. So if you can imagine, you were assaulted right away. If you were a, a trade person, if not a stay-at-home person, but if you went out into the work world, you were assaulted. If you had any kind of skill and were a part of a career-type job, you were assaulted with paganism. But, you know, we would say, you know, I don't believe that, and go ahead and do it, and I'm just going to stand here and let you do your thing. But that isn't where it ended. There were regular meetings of all the members of the trade guild. And these, uh, Ramsey, the uh, famed 19th century archaeologist, found the, the, the diary, as it were, of a, of a regular monthly meeting of these unions. And what he said is that business would follow... They would talk about their union. Then they would have the customary banquet uh, known for, in the ancient world, sexual license. Now listen to his excavation. This is what Ramsey said. On a regular basis, the believers of Roman Asia would be exposed to revelry, license, intoxication, marked by these pagan religious trade societies. The members would lounge on dining couches... Remember, they, like in the Last Supper, you would kind of recline and eat toward the center and your feet would be extended outward and you'd be leaning in, eating out of the middle. So they're, they're laying on these couches having their meals as they would have banquets for their, their guild. And they would be surrounded, Ramsey said, by troops of unclothed dancing and singing slave girls. So that's the kind of like the business lunches. Aren't you glad things are a little different nowadays? I mean, that would be unbelievable. But this is what Ramsey continues. He says, this conduct, this dining couch, intoxication, the dancing girls, would be fatal to all self-restraint of the spirit. In short, a guild was no place for a Christian, yet quitting the union would be economic suicide. So Paul is writing to a group of people that when they came to Christ, they were, they were losing something. They could no longer freely operate in, in the business world. They could no longer freely operate in the manufacturing world. They couldn't comfortably go through life like they used to go through life because something had changed. Their whole orientation had changed. Their whole, their whole outlook on what was going on around them had changed. So the battle with the flesh would rage every day in all these towns of Roman Asia. Add to that, when you got off work, the bathhouses. Remember, most people didn't have indoor plumbing back then. Indoor plumbing was common, you just didn't have it. Because the cities were laid out with central plumbing, and you would go for your bath to a bathhouse that the Roman government provided. They provided the wood and they'd heat the water and they just, it was just, the, it was a public service, kind of like we have trash removal, they had bathhouses. Well, in the ancient world, and we know that Paul went to these bathhouses because they accused Paul when he got to Thessalonica of being an escaped criminal. And that's because they saw when he took his bath, they saw his beaten back from being beaten with rods in, in Philippi. And so we know that he went to these bathhouses and that they saw him with all the stripes on his back. But these bathhouses in every city where prostitution was normal and considered healthy. In other words, if you didn't participate in the public different license that they did, they thought there was something wrong with you. Remember how, how the scriptures say they thought it strange that you do not follow them in their excesses? That's what's going on. They're living in this culture. Athletic facilities. Okay, so you, you, you want to get away from work and you stay away from the baths. How about working out? Well, athletic facilities, were, there was such an emphasis placed on the human body that many sports were practiced and competed in total nudity. You know the Greek statues, how they intricately show all the muscles and all the physique? That's because they worship the human body. So much so that you showed yours off in public. So if you can imagine, these saints were vexed with the flesh, with temptation, and with sin. Now, let's listen to Paul's words in Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. In fact, let's stand together for the reading of this, and then we'll pray, because I love this verse. And you know it by heart, but listen to it. Okay, Galatians 2.20. Paul
Paul, writing to these people in Roman Asia, in the province of Galatia, these people that are surrounded at work with dancing girls, that are surrounded at the bathhouse with, with prostitution forced on them, that they're surrounded every time they go to the athletic place with public nudity, every time they, they just are just surrounded by filth. Paul says, I wonder how to make it, you new ones in Christ. I'll explain my, my practice. I have been crucified, verse 20 of chapter 2 of Galatians, with Christ. He said, when Christ died on the cross, I was crucified with him. It is no longer I who live now. He says, it's not me who goes to work with the leather workers. It's no longer me who merely goes through the marketplace or by the athletic deals or to the bathhouse. But Christ lives in me. I'm not going alone to the guild. I'm not going alone to the athletic bathhouse wherever I go through life. Christ is living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, past tense, and gave himself for me. Whole different outlook on life. Paul said, it's not my body, it's his. It's not my eyes, it's his. It's not my mind, it's his. And it, it's the whole idea of how they operate in a world that's very parallel to ours today. Very parallel. Interesting. Let's bow together and ask the Lord to open our hearts to his word. Father in heaven, I pray we would understand how to apply your word. We are students of your word. We've spent our lives studying your word. But so often it's so difficult to, to actually bring it to pass in our lives. We struggle every day, just like they did. And I pray that through Paul's simple explanation of how to live, crucified every day, how to live, but not us living, and us uh, running out of strength and us running out of resistance, but living with not I anymore, but Christ. May that deeply, deeply penetrate our souls and our wills and our hearts. And Father, as we do bow before you tonight, we ask not only for you to open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word, but we also ask for you to energize and give great boldness to your servants we thank you that 73 precious saints went out last Sunday and they made many visits in the, the many teams that go out. But tonight as they've assembled again, representing you, we are supporting them. And we ask you, and in our hearts, we, we cry out to you to give them many open doors, many prepared hearts, much boldness by your Spirit, Help them to remember the verses and the outline and the proper responses to questions that they have been learning in their class in EE and help them as they give out the wonderful words of life. For us who stay, may you stir our hearts and teach us much from your word. And for those who go, protect and bless the going forth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, the battle was won by Christ. The battle with the flesh. The world and the devil all were defeated at the cross. It's not something we have to wait for to happen. It's done. The world, my flesh and yours, and the devil were all defeated. That's the teaching of the scripture. What we need to do is believe and act on that truth. But the question always comes, how do we do that regularly? How do you, as you're scooting through life, trying to keep up with just, just the endlessness of all that comes upon us, how do you do that? Well, two passages explain this truth. The first one is the one before you right now, Galatians 2.20, and that's the attitude that we need. Then, Colossians 3, are the actions that we're to take. But let's stop and look at the attitude. We need to repeat, reaffirm, and remember over and over again that the past work of Christ's death, that's what Paul's confessing here, Christ's death on the cross saved me and, that's past event, keeps me, that's the present. Paul was emphasizing this. Listen to what he says, and I'm going to read through it again, and I'm going to show you the, the emphasis of how he speaks. I have been crucified with Christ, verse 20. That's a past event. That's what we would call justification. It is no longer I who live, but Christ 
lives in me. That's a present event. That's what we call sanctification. You see how closely they're tied? The past event, what Christ did justifying me on the cross in the past, is totally tied to the present event of my sanctification. Christ living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. That's the present, again, explanation of what sanctification, what us going through life more and more conformed to the image of Christ is all about. But look how he ends. Who loved me and gave himself for me. He's back to the past event again. The justification. Now, in my mind, I look on this kind of like a sandwich. The past events are the outside, the contents are the, the present. But it's, it's held together by these two past events that he opens and closes the 20th verse. The past work of Christ on the cross secured my salvation. The present work of Christ offers to me sanctification in the present. That's what he's presently doing, but it's totally tied it's kind of opens and closes with looking at the fact that it's not conditioned on what I do. It's not conditioned on my output or my input. It's all based on what Christ has already done. Beautiful way that, that the Apostle Paul describes this. Everything he ends with in the 20th verse is based on the past, on what is done. And, and if, we really, if we really comprehend that, it just makes the whole celebration we're coming into of the cross of, of Resurrection Sunday so much more wonderful, especially when we sit at that Seder, as we're talking about, and think about what Christ accomplished for us coming up. This is a great season to study this. But how did we get saved? Again, think about that. By trusting, uh, clinging to the truth of Jesus Christ. He took my sins. He stood in my place. He bore my punishment that I deserve. And the guiltless Christ took the guilt that I have and that you have. That, that's the whole idea. He gave himself for me. Who loved me, at the end of this verse, and gave himself for me. In fact, Paul, this is Paul's testimony. If you want to hear, you know, this... The short form, you know, in EE you're supposed to have a long and a short form. Paul's short form is, he loved me and gave himself for me. That, that is his 15 second, that's less than 15 second, that's, that's his five second testimony. He loved me and gave himself for me. That's salvation. And Paul talks about that. The sinless one taking my sin, the holy one taking my wretchedness, and on and on we could all go if we think about what he did. But did I see him personally on the cross? No. Did Paul? There's speculation. Could be that while he was studying under Gamaliel, he might have seen the crucifixion. We don't know. But we know for sure we didn't see it. Right? You aren't. 2,000 years old, and I'm not either. So we didn't see the cross. So how do we believe in that? We believe in it by faith. Whom having not seen, we love. And whom, though now we see him not, we rejoice with joy unspeakable. It's, it's by faith. I believe the truth of God's word as a six-year-old. When my mom told me, I just believed. I just didn't know that anything else could possibly be true. But that, she just told me, that's God's word. I believe the truth of God's word. And God changed me. Forever, God changed me. I believe what he did in the past. That's what salvation. The same way we were saved is the same way we live the rest of our lives. So we apply that faith in the work of Christ to the rest of our walk. See, most of us really are, are sure about that salvation thing, but we really struggle with the temptation and doubts and fears and struggles and going through life. But Paul says, and now let's turn to Colossians, on the way to chapter 3, look at Colossians 2.6. I alluded to this last time, uh, but I want, last Sunday, but I want you to see it again. Colossians 2.6, Paul ties these two ideas together of, of the sanctification, justification idea and the same faith needed. Because I believe the truth of God's word and it changed me forever and the same way I was saved is the way I live the rest of my life. As Paul says in Colossians 2.6, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. The sanctification is tied to the same faith that we believed in and that he justified us by. There is a, a, a wonderful correspondence there. 
So apply that faith that you and I have for the work of Christ on the cross and apply it to the rest of our walk. And the truth is, flesh can't defeat flesh. My um, being good for six years wasn't good enough for God. That's how old I was before I was saved. Six years. I had six years to try my hardest to be good. And I couldn't accomplish enough to, to satisfy God. And I had to trust in His satisfaction, His dying in my place, the Lord Jesus Christ. Flesh can't defeat flesh. Resolves, promises, fighting, striving in our own power can only lead to defeat. So as we were saved, totally trusting in His work, so we walk totally trusting in what he's already done for us. That's what Paul's message is as we get to this third chapter. Now, why do we even have to consider this? Because if we don't heed the action we're supposed to take, remember we have this attitude, I'm crucified with Christ, I know all that's true, I know he died in my place, and I know it's all done. But if we don't act upon it, we have this glaring warning. How do we get to all this? We looked at the life of David and the life of Saul, and we saw that David, in spite of his sin, is honored as God's servant. We see that Saul is dishonored because his life was lost. And then we go to 1 Corinthians, and the Apostle Paul says, I don't want to suffer loss. So it is possible for us to suffer loss. How do we suffer loss? By not taking our responsible action from Colossians 3 and many other passages. Because God has left us with the failed lives of those in the scriptures, Saul, as one of the most sobering uh, pictures, as a reminder to us that arrayed against us this evening is our old life, our flesh. Galatians, we saw this this morning, 5. The flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit is lusting and fighting and striving and going against our flesh. And the two are contrary to one another. Now, Colossians 3, we see the action we must take to live the life of killing our flesh, mortifying our flesh, living the crucified life that Jesus Christ offers to us. What we saw this morning is uh, several things. The first imperative is in verse 1, seek those things which are above. You want to seek things above? You want to have kind of a heavenly perspective on life? Ask the Lord. Say, I know that just as you saved me, that you can cause me today to purposely, consciously, through your power and through the Spirit's prompting, to to seek things that are eternal. I I was sharing with you about the the caregivers that that Bob Nichols talked about, that were two Christian ladies that were with his grandmother as she died. They were way out in nowhere where his grandmother lives. And they they were not in the big city glitz, and they were not in a highly paid job, but they took care of his grandmother for the glory of God. And you know what the Bible says? You'll never lose your reward, even giving out cups of water in my name. And so there's something about having this heavenly perspective as you leave for work. I mentioned this morning, I used to be a corporate salesman for American Home Products. I would leave my home in Los Angeles and and take off uh, to go out and sell wherever I was, downtown or whatever. And I would say, Lord, I know today that I can either choose to be in this rat race of Los Angeles and all this choked freeway and all this money uh, struggle that they're all in, or I can, can look for the divine appointments today and really see life the way you see it, how you want me to fit into what you're doing here today. That's a conscious choice that we have to ask for. Second, we can set our mind on things above. There are so many distractions. You talk about distractions, everything is distracting to the ultimate in California. I mean, that's, that's just the ultimate expression of the flesh that I know of uh, between there and Vegas. It's just unbelievable. How do you live? It's getting that way in Tulsa. Set your mind on things above. Again, you say, Lord, I know I can turn my mind to your channel because you accomplished that on the cross, the strength. Then, where we begin this evening is in the fifth verse. And I want you to look at this. This is a systematic routing or or, uh, kind of decimating the works of the flesh that we have to do in our lives. And what he says is here, I want you to put to death your members that are on the earth. And, And what he's talking about is the Roman 6 idea that every time we yield to temptation, whatever part of us we yield, whether it's our mind or our eyes or 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 our body itself, that we have just made that member as an instrument of unrighteousness. So what he said is, every time we we let our members be instruments of unrighteousness, we have to put to death 
We have to stop that. We have to do radical surgery. We have to kill those evil desires. What are they? Look in your Bibles. In New King James it says there are five of them. Fornication. Number two, uncleanness. Number three, passion. Number four, evil desire. Number five, covetousness. Uh, NIV, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed. Uh, Same idea, same words. Let's do fornication first. What he says is, Number one, fornication and uncleanness must go. Now, who's he talking to? Remember, he wasn't talking to Tulsans primarily. We're secondary. He's talking to people in Roman Asia, people in the highest developed culture of the Roman Empire. Chastity, which is absence of fornication, was a completely new virtue that Christianity brought into the world. That was not really a thought about thing. You know what their thoughts were? The food is for body and the body is for food. So the body is for immoral things. We were made to express ourselves. And what's one of the most delightful ways to express yourself? It's in the sexual realm. And so they said, just do it. Christianity brought chastity. In the ancient world, sexual relationships before marriage, outside of marriage, inside of marriage, and with anything that you could possibly think of were normal and accepted. While Paul was writing this epistle to the Colossians, the man that was the president, the emperor, was an openly practicing homosexual sodomite. And he would appear in public, Nero I'm talking about, he would appear in public with his wife. His wife was a castrated male slave. I mean, how gross could you get to show up in public with Florus? This, this, this evil representation of all the homosexuality was in the Roman Empire. And yet, that's who, who was Nero's consort. And Nero was just flaunting what the culture believed. The sexual appetite was regarded as a thing to be gratified, not controlled. And the Christian ethic of insisting on chastity regarding the physical relationship between the sexes as something precious and indiscriminate use spoiled it was so bizarre to them that they just, they just thought the Christians were weird. Kind of like, what's, you know, what island did you come from? We don't know anything about this. Fornication... Any sexuality outside of, uh, of marriage uh, was, was condemned by God and misunderstood, I mean, not understood by the pagans. And so Paul had to tell the believers, you cannot go back to the way you were raised in the, your culture. And you say, well, we don't live like that. You know, Oklahoma is pretty tame, right? Is it? Why is it that in every church, the number one or number two sin in every single church sin list was always fornication? Because no matter whether it's publicly known or not, this is always lurking in the background. I know just we just had the situation with the the pastor here in town with his secret life. But what we should think about is we, we shouldn't kid ourselves. There are many people who are covering up this sin in their thoughts or in their secret life. And yet, they still talk the talk that everything is okay. And Paul's saying, no. No, he brings it out in the open. He tells us that we are to put our physical members in the place of death. Do your eyes cause your trouble? Do you look with the eye of lust? Put those eyes in the place of death. And use them as the eyes of Christ to look on him. That changes things. And on and on you go. If it's not the eyes, if it's the mind, you say, it's no longer my eyes, it's no longer my mind, but Christ who lives in me. Now, how do you do that? Again, as we did this morning, because of Christ's death for my sins, He can now defeat any form of fornication in my life. If I ask Him to. If I want Him to. Remember how it says, uh, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful who always make a way of escape. See the lit exit sign over there? There's always the Lord's very clear way out in every one of these that we're going to look at. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, anger, wrath, and malice, and all the other ones we're going to see. What do we do? We say, Lord Jesus, right now I want you to kill Every immoral desire in my life. You know what? You'll have to ask him to do that tomorrow. 
And, and if you're like St. Augustine, you have to ask it every five minutes. Because St. Augustine, you know, St. Augustine, the, the, one of the greatest minds of all, he lived such a Roman life before he got saved that, that after he got saved, all of his former girlfriends used to chase him, one in particular. And, and he, just, he just was so, so learning this truth that he had to say, Lord Jesus, right now. And he, in his diaries, he'd say that he had to, every few moments, say, Lord Kill that desire. Kill that, that memory I have. Kill that sight I just saw as he went by the bathhouse. Kill what I just saw when I went by the athletic fields. Kill what I just saw, the dancing girls, while I was at this banquet. He says, I, those are your eyes. And you see, it isn't a once for all, I've dealt with that. He's saying we should be constantly putting to death any member. If our ears get us to sin, in fact, I was, I was just... Standing in line, I rarely listen to that music. You know, I don't, personally, I mean, it doesn't matter what form it is, I just don't like this, this kind of modern music. I just don't like it at all. And I, was, and I stood there and I listened, and I asked Johnny, my son, I said, I was listening, what is that? And he, he told me what they were saying, because they usually say it so fast, and you know, it's just... And I went, that's vile. He says, yeah, it is. He said, most of you older people can't really understand what they're saying. It was, it was totally sexual in nature, and it was wicked. And so if your ears draw you to sin, you have to, you have to say, Lord, kill the immoral desire in my life through my ears, through my eyes, through my mind. But look at the next one, uncleanness. This, this word, impurity or uncleanness, the second word in verse 5, includes thoughts, words, looks, gestures, even jokes. Have you ever noticed how many jokes come down, especially, you know, a lot of the ones that, that go on, especially with men, when they carry on and on, they just kind of, a lot of them get a sexual nature to them. I don't mean, bla- I just mean kind of, they just kind of go that direction. That's uncleanness. It's impurity. And because of Christ's death for my sins, he can now defeat any form of impurity and uncleanness in my life. And we just say, Lord Jesus, right now I want you to remove all impurity and filthiness from my heart. Because out of the abundance of the what? Heart, the what speaks? The mouth. To tell or repeat an unclean thing, that means that it's lodged here. Actually, it's here, but it's more understandable here. You know, it's in our heart. And so how do we get it out of there? It's not by, you know, you remember when you were little, did your mother, I used to get my mouth washed out with soap. Ivory soap does not taste good. I learned that, you know. And she'd put it on a washcloth and just about gag me, you know, stick her hand there and pull my tongue, you know, and uh, really give it to me. And I mean, I didn't know any obscene talk. I I would just talk back to her. But you know what? That didn't really correct the problem because it wasn't in my mouth. It was where? In my heart. So how do you get out of your heart? You, before the Lord, based on what he's already done. Not saying, Lord, I don't want to do that again. I do. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. You say, no, Lord, I know that you, through your death for me on the cross, have defeated my flesh and the world around hold on me and the devil and his demons that are trying to, to penetrate my life. And I ask you to remove the impurity and filthiness from my heart. Now, it keeps coming in. It is, again, it's not like you can just get one spraying and the termites are gone for 50 years. They're constantly coming and attacking. And they're, they're coming in a lot of unseen ways. And so we have to constantly do that. Thirdly, passion or lust. Uh, inordinate affection, uncontrolled passion. This third world, or third word here in verse 5 is the kind of person who is a slave of his passion. That's what this word means. It's, it's a, different. It's not the normal word for lust. It's a little different. Uh, polkas is the word. But it speaks of a slave to whatever passion is there. It's kind of like someone who really gets into stuff. And they can get into this passion for, inordinately, for anything. And he says, watch out for that. And again, because Christ died for us, he can defeat any impurity and uncleanness and passion and lust. And we can just ask him, I want you to remove that that slavery I have in my life to whatever it is. I mean, people can get can get enslaved to anything. I just read uh, in the news that that they figure that Americans are going to waste one point six billion dollars a day because they're going to live stream to the computer screen some athletic event that's going on. And they said that people are going to not be able to resist it. There's going to, they're going to be able to watch uh, this competition in basketball or something, and they're going to be able to see it at work. 
because they can't stop. And they want to do it. And they said, productivity is going to go down. And the Lord says, doesn't matter what you get enslaved to. Evil desires. King James, evil concupiscence. Evil desire is a person who is driven by a desire for wrong things. And again, we can say, Lord Jesus, liberate me from my uncontrolled drive for wrong things. Whatever form they are. And covetousness, and this is more in, in the realm of, of where so much of America is, greed, which is idolatry. Uh, this word, pleonixia, is one of the ugliest sins. It's hard to find a single word to translate. It comes from two Greek words. The first half, pleon, means more, and the second half means to have. More to have is what this word is. The, the word covetousness in Greek is more to have. More to have of what? Well, it's the idea of the insatiable desire to have more of whatever we like. Uh, It's been described as a ruthless self-seeking. Therefore, it's a sin with a wide range. If it's a desire for money, it would lead to theft. We want money so much. Did you read about this born-again Christian from Bush's uh, second-floor staff that, that said his policy? They got caught at Target returning stuff that 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 he had. He bought it, took it out to his car, took the receipt, put it in a bag, went and tried to return it. And, and thousands of dollars. This, this administrator, and our, uh, one of these born-again people that was helping Bush. You know what that is? Pleonixia. I, I, Bonnie said, why would anybody ever do that? I said, have you ever tried to live in Washington, D.C.? You commute for an hour. It costs hundreds of thousands to buy a house there. You got to have fancy clothes all the time. You work around the clock. You're eating out all the time. They never civil pay isn't enough to afford that. So this guy got in the trap, thinking he needed to earn a little money on the side. He's returning stuff. If if he really did what the cameras caught him doing, he was a uh, gripped by pleonixia, this insatiable desire to have more, and it leads to theft. If if it's the desire for prestige, it leads to evil ambition. If it's the desire for power, it leads to tyranny. If it's the desire for a person, it leads to sexual sin. Uh, Mool, commenting on this, said, he's a commentator, this word is the opposite of desire to give. I was discipling uh, uh, one of the new couples that comes to the church, and they are new in the Lord, and I was meeting in my office and praying with them, and they said, we've got to tell you something. He said, you know what? We were raised to love money. And they said, this church is the first time we ever heard about giving money. And the young lady said, the first time I heard that, I was just shocked. Give away money? You don't give away money. You get it. And so she said she tried it. She said the the first time she gave money in the offering, she said it was the most unbelievable liberation in her heart. And she said, now she is a giver. You know why? The the flesh is an insatiable desire to get. The spirit wants to liberate us and give us a desire to give. This word, covetousness, is the opposite of the desire to give. It is opposite of how our flesh wants for us to be giving our time and our our heart and, and compassion and our resources. So how do we get rid of this covetous greediness? Well, because of Christ's death for our sins, he can defeat any form of enslaving passion. We can say, Lord, I want you to liberate me from always wanting more of anything but you. That's really what this comes down to. We want Christ most. Pleasing him, investing for him, living for him, giving to him. Remember, when you give, we take offerings here regularly. Uh, this morning we had the double offering, you know, the, the coin and the regular. And, you know, when you give to that, you're not giving to our treasurer. You're not giving to the elders' council handling stewardship. You are not giving, certainly, to, to the pastoral staff. You're really not even giving to the church. You and I are really giving to Christ. And that changes our attitude of giving. It's not... Wondering if they're going to spend it right and wondering if they're going to squander, wondering if they're going to buy something that I don't agree with. That care of the money goes with our gift to the Lord who oversees those who spend it. And so we say, Lord, I want you to liberate me from always wanting more of anything but you. I just give to you. But look at verse 8, because that's where the imperatives continue. 
But now you ourselves are to put off all these. There's a difference, a change here. Went from mortifying, killing, doing uh, surgical excision, going to the great physician, say, cut that, cut that, cut that, to now uh, a different metaphor. He says, put off all these. Paul was saying that there are certain things the Colossians must strip themselves of. The word here is actually the word for undressing or pulling off the clothes. And what, what he said is, it's, a, it's something that is a picture from the life of the early church. In the first century church, part of the way they baptized people, and we know this from church history, when a Christian was baptized, they would put off their old clothes and would go down in the water, and when they emerged, they would put on new pure white robes. It, it's kind of from Judaism. Today... They've excavated, and in fact, they're finding more and more of them, these mikvah, these, these uh, purifying baths that were by the temple. In the ancient world, every temple had a bath place next to it. Because when you worshipped your God, false or the true and living God, you always would wash yourself and clothe yourself with a robe to come before him. See, even in culture is this idea of needing to be clothed with purity to come before a deity. But when the early church members got baptized, they followed much of Judaism's baptism for this, this purifying bath, where when you would go into the temple, you would bathe, clothe yourself with a clean robe, and go in. And so when they got baptized in Christ, they had them come in their old clothes, and they would strip those clothes off them, they'd go into the water and be baptized, and then the church would provide a new fresh robe to put on, which was a picture of the old, gone, and clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So he uses this word that that finds itself in the literature of the early church, and he says, this divesting of one kind of life and putting on another is what you are to be doing all the time, not just once when you get baptized, when you're confessing your faith in Christ. What are we supposed to be stripping off? He lists them. Look in verse 8. Anger. Uh, wrath, or NIV calls it rage, malice is the third one, blasphemy, the NIV calls it slander, and filthy language out of your mouth. Those are all under this imperative, this, this imperative of putting off. So what do we do? We say, because of Christ, who died in my place, because of what he accomplished, because I was crucified with Christ, he can now strip off of me anything that grieves or quenches his working. In and through me. Now, I want you to think about that. We should ask the Lord, right now I want you to strip off these areas of my life. You struggle with anger? You don't have to. You can have Christ strip off any unbiblical anger or rage, wrath, or malice, or blasphemy, or filthy language. What are those? Let let me just go through them. The first one, anger, uh, there, is, there are two kinds of anger. There's biblical anger, there's positive anger. Jesus was angry. He got mad at the, at the uh, Pharisees because of the hardness of their heart. That's not sinful. To be angry at sin, it's not sinful. So there is positive anger. The problem is we're angry over the wrong things. This word orge is an anger that's become inveterate. It's a long-lasting, slow-burning anger that refuses to be pacified, that nurses wrath to keep it warm, kind of like a fire we're always stoking. You ever met someone like that? I mean, anything can make him mad. The dog can make him mad. The paper can make him mad. They threw the paper in the wrong place, or the paper got wet, or someone ruined something, or scraped their car, or they didn't get their... I mean, I, I just saw someone actually get angry because they said that, that their coffee wasn't right. And I thought... You're mad about coffee? I mean, recently, if you read the news, people kill each other over the strangest things because there is this undealt with orge, this this anger that is constantly fed, and it kind of slowly burns. And then it, it just comes out. What do we do with that? Well, because Jesus conquered all those things, we can ask him to to strip off from us that anger. I have a fireplace. I love my fire. I'm so sad it's getting 80 outside. I still had it going today, and I thought, oh, Lord, is it really spring? You know, do I have to stop burning my fireplace, my wood? I mean, I just, the kids help me. It's just like campfire time. You know, it's just fun. Did you know that if you keep working and and you keep pushing those coals together and putting a little more wood on, you can have a 24-hour day fire in your fireplace? You know, a lot of people have anger like that. They just keep feeding it. We have to ask the Lord to strip off 
our ungodly anger, this wrath or rage. Anger becomes wrath when we develop an unforgiving spirit. The word thumas is a blaze of sudden anger which is quickly kindled and just as quickly dies. The Greeks likened it to fire among straw, you know, like weeds or something. Just just goes like that and it's over. It quickly blazes and just as quickly burns out. For the Christian, both the burst of temper, which is wrath, and the long-lasting anger, which is the first word, both are wrong. You know, there's some people like that. They just blow up and it's all over and they're just kind of happy, friendly. They've spewed out on everybody else. Both are wrong. And because of Christ's death, he can defeat any form of improper wrath. And we can say, Lord, strip off my outbursts of wrath and rage. Sometimes we don't want him to do it because we want to get even. Or we want to stay hurt. Or we want to stay, you know, out of sorts, whatever, with people. It's, it's us wanting Christ. He's already defeated our flesh. He's already defeated the world. He's already conquered. And he's already there to set us free. Malice, the next word. Uh, kakia, it's another interesting word. It means viciousness of mind, um, literally. It's all-pervading evil. Someone has said malice is congealed anger. That's an interesting way to look at it. You take anger and you, you solidify it, and there you have malice. It's an anger that's been nursed along. It's an anger that tries to get revenge and even... Uh, uh, try and harm someone else. That's the vicious side of it. And what Paul is saying is that maliciousness is like an old, dirty, filthy garment. It doesn't represent Christ. And we can't strip it off because it's part of us. See, the idea of this is not, "Mm, I'm going to resolve that. I'm going to take a deep breath and think of something else. I'm not going to be angry. Yeah, it works. Five seconds, ten seconds, half hour, who knows? But it's not what we're talking about here. This is not biblical change. That is just resolve, you know, that, that I'm going to be better. And, and malice can't be overcome by anything other than saying, Lord Jesus, right now, strip off my viciousness, my, my kakia, my, my malice that I have. You know it. I know it. I know I feed it. I don't want it take it away two more blasphemy or NIV puts it slander insulting and slander speaking in general uh, when it's directed against God it's blasphemy uh, defaming the name of God not just taking his name in vain misrepresenting him hating him like in the death of a child how could you do this you know that's a form of blasphemy to be angry at God and, and it happens sometimes people are overcome with situations But it's much more likely this word, uh, blasphemy in the context, is slanderous talk against a fellow man, a person, another another believer or anybody in general. And, And what he's saying is, don't slander. And because of Christ's death, he can strip off slander from us just just bad mouthing is the way that. My parents used to go, don't badmouth them, they'd say. Don't, don't tell bad things about them. And then the last one is filthy language out of your mouth. The word uh, is foul communication. It means abusive speech, filthy speech, obscene speech. And what, what he's telling them is, don't ever let your, yourself be clothed with these things. Don't be clothed with anger. That's a dirty garment. Don't be clothed with rage. Don't be clothed with this maliciousness. Don't be clothed with blasphemy or slander. Don't have any obscene talk. How do we do that? We say, Lord Jesus, right now cleanse my mouth and my heart so nothing inside me is filthy. Nothing inside me is smoldering. Nothing inside me is 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 feeding that that anger or that viciousness that I want to harm someone else. It's so neat when you give vengeance to the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will recompense. We can never pay people back for what they've done to harm us. And God says, I will always execute vengeance my way, my time. Give it to me. And that's why Paul could operate. He was so maligned, so harmed, so abused, so treated... And he just gave it to the Lord. But he still suffered. He says, who suffered and not been hurt? He goes through his list. But after he felt that, after his heart or his mind or or whatever was was tainted and became an instrument potentially of or actually of uh, slander or abuse, he'd say, Lord, I don't want that member. I don't want my tongue to respond that way. Do you remember when 
he was with the high priest and he said thou whitewash wall and they slapped him and you know and and he when he heard it was a high priest, he says, I didn't mean to do that. You saw, you saw sanctification in process right there. I mean, that high priest was a Christ-dishonoring uh, man. But Paul would not dishonor his position. And we see sanctification at place in his life. So, before we go tonight, I would like to just have you bow with me. And I want to read through this. And, and if there's any struggle in our lives with any of these things, let's deal with it tonight before we go. If there's a a struggle with sexual immorality, either in your mind or reality, with uncleanness and impurity, with passion or lust, with evil desire, with covetousness or greed, with anger, with wrath or rage, with malice, with blasphemy or slander, or with filthy language, let's do something about it. Let's bow before the Lord. Listen to these words and then pray with me. Because of Christ's death for my sins, Christ can now defeat any form of these sins that displease him and that kill my fellowship with the Lord. Any filthiness in my talk, any anger in my heart, any yielding of my members for sexual immorality, any impurity in my heart that springs out, Lord Jesus, right now, cleanse my mouth, cleanse my heart, so that nothing inside of me is filthy, abusive, smoldering, nothing that will cause me to dishonor you. Strip away these filthy garments from my heart. Just take a moment, and whatever the Spirit of God has pointed out to you, just affirm that and say, Lord, because of your death in my place, strip these things off. I don't want them. I'm a new creature. And you and you alone can defeat this in my life. And let this be the beginning of a regular fleeing to be crucified anew and afresh with Christ by letting him live and reminding ourselves of what he's already done. So it's not me trying, but it's Christ living through me. Father, teach us the reality of crucified living Help us this week as we read your word to see what you command us. You've given us the power through your spirit because of your death by your grace to accomplish. And let us strip off the old. And as we'll see next time, consciously clothe ourselves with the new. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you as you go in Christ.